this one chart can have investors on Wall Street laughing to the bank while sending everyday citizens into a complete panic. Some say that this chart can predict the future. If you saw my last video on bonds, welcome back. But if you haven't seen that yet, definitely check that out first. Because today, we're going to dive deep into the yield curve and why it may matter more than you think. I'm Keith D, here to talk everything money and markets. Let's jump right into it. First, what exactly is the yield curve? It's a graph that plots the yields or interest rates of government bonds across different time lengths or maturities. On the front end of the curve, you have short-term treasuries like the two-year and below. Whereas on the long end of the curve, you have treasuries like the 10-year or the 30-year. One thing that is important to note is that when we talk about interest rates, we talk about them in terms of basis points. You might see this referred to as BPS in writing, or you might even hear someone call it BIPS out loud. A basis point is one one hundredth of a percent or 0.01%. And so 100 basis points is 1%. Another thing that is important to note is that the interest rate itself is not always the thing that really matters all that much, but instead the rate at which that rate is changing. And so for instance, let's say interest rates are at 1% and then interest rates go up by 50 basis points or 0.5%. While that doesn't sound like much, that's actually a 50% increase in the interest rate. Whereas if rates were at 5% and they moved by 50 basis points, that move would only be 10%. But in the world of rates, even a smaller move like that can make a really big difference. But it makes a really big difference when interest rates are low, like we just mentioned. For example, Japan has had near zero or even negative interest rates for years. And when they decided to go from negative or zero to even just positive by 25 basis points, it sent shockwaves through markets. Or like in the United States back in 2020, at that time, the Federal Reserve had to cut the short end of rates down to zero, but then in 2022 had to quickly reverse that action and had one of the fastest rate hiking cycles that had happened in decades. And as this occurred, borrowing costs rose and this led to some of the largest bank failures in all of history. Now, let's take a second to talk about why long-term rates are usually higher than short-term rates. Imagine you want to lend money to your friend. Would you be okay with getting the same reward for lending money to your friend for one month as you would for lending money to your friend for 10 years? Probably not. The main idea here is that lending money for longer is riskier. And here are three reasons why. The first is inflation risk. The idea is that the price of goods may go up over the course of years. And so, for an example, let's say that inflation goes from 1% up to 5%, but you have a loan or you own a bond that is paying 2%. So in the beginning, you're actually still beating inflation by 1% because inflation was at 1% and you were earning 2% on your bond. But now, if inflation goes up to 5% and your bond is still only paying you that 2% that you locked in at a longer term, then you're actually losing 3% because the price of goods is going up by 5%, but you're only earning 2% on that bond. So now the real rate of return of that bond is actually negative 3% because it isn't keeping up with the inflation of the price of goods. Now, in reality, when inflation expectations rise, bond prices usually fall, which would make the total return even worse than the example that I just gave. 
The second is just uncertainty risk in general. Technically, we have no idea what's going to happen over a 10 year period. And the longer the time frame, the less that you can really predict what's going to occur. So the economy could change. Your borrower's ability to pay back that loan might change and so on and so forth. Third is opportunity cost. Having your money tied up in one place for a long period of time means that you couldn't use that money to do something else. Because of these risks, investors demand a premium for lending money over longer periods of time. And this is often referred to as term premium. And this is why long term rates are typically higher than short term rates. Now that we understand some of the basics of the yield curve, let's talk about what the yield curve means for banks and how that can affect everyday citizens. Banks make a large part of their income from their lending activities, where they will borrow short and then lend long. Let's talk about what that means. Banks get money from people who deposit their money at the bank, and these are essentially short term loans. That is the borrow short part of the equation, where I, as a depositor, am going to give my money to the bank and they're going to see that as a short term loan. And for that, they will pay me a lower interest rate. In the meantime, they're going to essentially take that money. And we've talked about why it's not exactly that they're technically creating new money, but they're going to take that money and then they're going to lend it out over the long term in the form of loans like a mortgage or a business loan, which is going to be at a higher rate. The difference between what the bank makes on those long term loans and the money that they're paying out to depositors in the short term is called net interest margin. Actually, this is technically the net interest income. The net interest margin is that income as a percentage of the bank's total interest earning assets. So it's a profitability ratio, or you'll see it as NIM. And you can think of net interest margin as the bank's profit margin on its lending activities. When the yield curve is normal, meaning short term rates are lower than long term rates, then banks can easily borrow in the short term and lend out in the long term and have a healthy net interest margin and have healthy profits. But when the yield curve inverts, meaning that short term rates are higher than long term rates, then that net interest margin at banks can shrink or even go negative because the bank has to pay more to borrow on the short term, but then can't necessarily charge more for longer term loans. A shrinking net interest margin means less profits for banks. And in that scenario, they're going to typically tighten their lending standards, which makes it harder for businesses and people to get loans, which also slows down the economy and can even sometimes trigger a recession. And that's a big part of why the yield curve is watched so closely. It gives us an idea of what's going on in the banking system and how that can affect the overall economy. Now that we have an idea of why the yield curve matters, let's talk about how it moves. A steepening yield curve means the gap between the short term and long term rates is growing. A bull steepener is when short term rates fall faster than long term rates. And this can happen because the economy is slowing and the central bank is cutting rates in the front end. This can lead to a bullish stock market because investors are essentially predicting that in the future, because rates are lower, there will be more economic growth down the line. And that's why this is called a bull steepener. A bear steepener happens when the long term rates actually rise faster than the short term rates. And this can happen because of a strong economy or inflation. And now this can put downward pressure on stocks, because imagine if long term rates are higher, then technically that equity risk premium is going to shrink and investors could just buy bonds instead of holding risky stocks over the long term. That's part of why this is called a bear steepener. A flattening curve means that the difference between the long term and the short term rates actually shrinks. A bull flattener is when long term rates fall faster than short term rates. 
And now this can signal slower growth in the future. But what it also means is that borrowing costs for businesses right now over the long term is lower and therefore it can make stocks more attractive. Also, if long term rates in the bond market are lower, then there's more of a reason for investors to take risk and that equity risk premium has more room. A bear flattener is when short term rates are rising faster than long term rates. And this can happen because a central bank is hiking rates for instance, in order to slow down inflation. And this can be a bearish sign for the markets because you have rising borrowing costs for businesses. And that's why we call this a bear flattener. And once again, an inverted yield curve is when short-term interest rates are higher than long-term interest rates, causing the curve to be upside down. Now, while it is important to note that over the past 50 years, a yield curve inversion has come before every recession. Not every time that the yield curve inverts do we actually get a technical recession. So what is a recession anyway? A recession is officially defined by two consecutive quarters of negative economic growth. This means that the country's total output or GDP is negative for six months straight. But sometimes the economy can slow without meeting that technical definition of a recession. So sometimes a yield curve will invert and investors expect trouble ahead, but we never get a quote unquote recession and the government never calls it that. Just another thing to think about when it comes to yield curve inversions and what it really means for the economy. It can signal economic stress, but not lead to a literal recession. Now that we know how the yield curve moves, let's talk about why it moves. First, let's go over expectations theory. The idea here is that long-term rates simply reflect what investors think that short-term rates will be in the future. If they expect short-term rates to rise in the future, then long-term rates will rise now and vice versa. Second, we have the liquidity preference theory. The idea here is that investors demand a premium for locking their capital away for long periods of time. So even if they don't expect short term rates to rise in the future, they're still going to demand a higher rate of return for longer term bonds. Next, we have market segmentation theory. And the idea here is that certain investors simply prefer certain parts of the yield curve. So some investors only want short term bonds and some only want long term bonds. And so the supply and demand factors for each market segment are actually what's going to shape the curve. And then we have the inflation expectations theory, with the idea being that if investors expect inflation to rise in the future, then they're going to demand higher yield from long term bonds to compensate for the fact that they would otherwise lose purchasing power. Higher inflation means that dollars will be worth less in the future. So investors want compensation for that risk. Together, these different theories help to explain how the yield curve takes its shape. Beyond what investors expect or prefer, central banks can also have a huge impact on the yield curve, mainly because they essentially control the short term rates and then also can directly influence the long term rates as well. In the United States, the Federal Reserve influences the short term rates by its policy rate called the federal funds rate. And this is the rate that banks charge each other for overnight loans. When inflation is rising or when the economy is overheating, the Fed will raise rates to slow down borrowing. When the economy is weak or slowing down, the Fed will lower rates in order to encourage more borrowing. That's how central banks in general can control the front end of the curve. Now, on the long end of the curve in the United States, the Federal Reserve can practice what's called quantitative easing, where they go out and buy long term U.S. government debt, such as treasuries or even mortgage backed securities. When the Fed buys these long term securities, they are essentially increasing the demand for those securities, which raises the price and then lowers the yield on those long term bonds. This can make borrowing cheaper for things like mortgages or long term business loans, helping to 
ease conditions and spur long-term growth in the economy. Now, quantitative easing is important because although the Fed and other central banks have control over the front end of the curve, the long end of the curve is typically just set by investors' expectations. And sometimes these investors have different ideas about what could happen over the long term than what the front end of the curve is necessarily signaling. As an example, sometimes the Fed will lower short term interest rates and that will actually lead to a spike in the long term interest rates because investors are essentially expecting that because we've lowered rates that now there will be more inflation in the future. So quantitative easing is a way for the Fed to get a little bit more control over what happens in the long end of the curve. The yield curve is not just a US story. Interest rates and yield curves around the world matter too. Investors often compare yields around the world, looking for the best return opportunities while balancing their overall risk. When one country's interest rates rise, it can lead to capital flowing into that country or into that country's currency in order to take advantage of higher interest rates and vice versa if interest rates go down, capital might flow out of an economy. This can affect the exchange rates of the currencies, borrowing costs and global economic stability. For example, if rates in the United States rise faster than in other countries, then the demand for US dollars to buy US bonds could go up and that could strengthen the US dollar versus other currencies. When that happens, it could actually make US exports more expensive and therefore impact global trade. So central banks around the world watch each other closely because if one central bank is gonna raise rates, then the other might do the same to prevent having capital flight where money moves from their jurisdiction over into another. One of the most relevant examples of how all of this can play out is actually happening right now with the Japanese yen reverse carry trade. Let me know in the comments if you wanna hear more about that. But overall, the yield curve is a very powerful tool and different groups are actually gonna be looking at it in different ways. Wall Street professionals, for instance, have access to a plethora of different financial instruments they have these different derivatives, options, and futures, and even structured products, which are just custom made financial instruments. And this allows them to actively trade based on what they're seeing in the yield curve or in the economy in general. So they can hedge themselves if things were to start to go wrong. But for everyday people and businesses, what's happening with the yield curve can affect you much more directly in real life. But understanding the yield curve can be very helpful for making long-term decisions and even thinking about what your next move may be. And that's how a simple little line on a chart can completely change the outcome of billions of people. Whether you're investing or looking to buy a home one day or just interested in what's happening with the economy, this is by far one of the best signals to look at. If you found this helpful, be sure to like and subscribe. And if you wanna go any deeper, check out the link in the description to my paid community. Inside, we're sharing insights about investing, what we're seeing in the economy, and how technology is changing all of that. I'm Keith D, here to talk everything money and markets. I'll see you next time.